Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India We continue our discussion from the last lecture where we were discussing the casting defects introduced during ingot casting. Now another defect which is very prominent for example blow holes. Blow holes are entrapment of gas bubbles in a solid ingot. They are entrapment, entrapment of gas bubbles in solid ingot, in solid ingot. Why it forms? or rather how they form or why it forms in semi killed and rimming steel the deoxidation is not complete. In fact, in rimming steel no deoxidation is done. In semi killed steel the steel is partially deoxidized. Therefore, during casting the dissolved oxygen it reacts with the carbon and on account of this reaction the CO gas evolves and the CO gas escapes from the ingot to the atmosphere. And when top portion of the ingot gets solidified then there are no chances of escaping of the CO gas bubble outside the ingot and therefore these bubbles are entrapped and as a result of which we get the so called blow hole. Now what are the effects of these blow holes? What are the effects that it can produce? So in why it forms I can write down due to C plus O is equal to CO reaction during solidification. Now what are the effects? In fact blow holes are structural defects blow holes are structural defects blow holes can counter blow holes can counter the shrinkage And as a result, one can also eliminate the shrinkage cavity because of the stirring provided by carbon monoxide bubble during solidification. Blow holes which are situated interior the ingot, they can be welded up during rolling. So that is also one of the effect. Then in fact, surface blow holes, say blow holes which are present at the surface, surface blow holes are harmful. Why? Because during reheating, the steel will be oxidized and as such it will do the harmful during rolling. What is the remedy? What is the remedy? Remedy is only control of deoxidation practice. Control of deoxidation practice or one should see that the blow holes are not present in the ingot at the top surface because they are only the harmful. Now another defect is for example segregation. As I have said, 
in my first lecture on solidification segregation is caused by the rejection of solute elements during solidification and why there occurs rejection because of the very low solubility of that impurity element in the solid. So, the excess is rejected and on account of it the segregation can occur. So, the mechanism in fact as the solidification proceeds chill layer forms in the vicinity of the mold and the excess solute is rejected and as you have seen a mushy zone forms, cells they grow, dendrites are formed and within the interdendritic region the liquid which is there is enriched in the solute elements because it is accumulating throughout the solidification period due to very low solubility of element in the solid. So, as a result of which interdendritic region will be enriched by the solid and as we know that the macro structure of killed steel say macro structure of the killed steel ingots macro structure of killed steel ingots they show for example concentration of solute in the form of in the form of V shape which is formed below the primary pipe and this is called positive segregation. This is called positive segregation that is here the concentration of solute concentration of solute is greater than average concentration and that is below the pipe. Another region one can see is the zones in the bottom ingot, zones in the bottom ingot where concentration of solute is less than some average value and this is called negative segregation this is called negative segregation may be because in the bottom the solidification has occurred earlier. So, there are no chance of further segregation which has occurred already, but near the end of the pipe or just below the pipe solidification occurs towards the last stage. So, more solute will be uh, rejecting during solidification and hence concentration of the solute will be somewhat greater than the average concentration. In rimming steel that is an advantage that the chances of segregation is very very minimum. Why? Because of the rimming action. The rimming action is provided by the reaction between carbon and oxygen which forms carbon monoxide and due to the rimming reaction there is a very good amount of agitation into the bath and as a result of which segregation can be very much minimized when compared with killed steel because in killed steel there is no such agitation during the solidification. Remedy, how we can remove it? One way of removal during solidification itself. Now, during solidification how will we do? One, we provide agitation. agitation during solidification. Now, we have to see how we are going to provide agitation during solidification because if you can agitate the liquid steel during solidification, then it will homogenize the concentration and hence chances of segregation will be minimized. 
another way of removal of this uh, segregation is that the micro segregation which results in the interdendritic region can be eliminated by a treatment called homogenization homogenization now this homogenization treatment is given after the solidification to the ingot during the reheating stage homogenization treatment does not part or does not form a part of solidification process but it forms a part during rolling or heat treatment operation so at that stage the micro segregation which is there in killed steel ingot it can be eliminated by homogenization that by heating over a long period of time now another say defect is non metallic inclusions as we all we have discussed quite a lot about non metallic inclusions there could be exogenous inclusions or indigenous inclusions exogenous inclusions are the entrapment of refractory wear of the refractory and indigenous inclusion they form during solidification in the interdendritic region remedy is very simple you have to modify them because there is no other way then another defect is internal fractures and cracks internal fractures and cracks now this is formed due to thermal stresses due to thermal stresses caused by either rapid cooling of the ingot or by rapid reheating during rolling purposes now here hairline cracks hairline cracks are caused by high hydrogen content of steel by high hydrogen content of steel now question is why hairline cracks form why hairline cracks form why they form first hydrogen has a negligible solubility has a negligible solubility in solid steel in solid steel and second hydrogen has a high diffusion coefficient has a high diffusion coefficient what does it mean means that which will result in desorption of hydrogen that means as heating is done then hydrogen will continuously desorb from the steel and uh, because of the high pressure sometimes hairline cracks are developed on the surface as regards the internal fracture it's not much of the problem if you have the internal fractures because they get welded up during rolling but as regards hairline cracks they can propagate on to the surface and eventually it may cause the so called defect in the product so that is all about the ingot casting now with this let me proceed to the another casting method which is continuous casting
continuous casting. As the name suggests, molten steel is solidified continuously in the form of semi finished product. That means, molten steel is cast in such a way so that it gets solidified constantly and continuously in the form of semi finished product. This semi finished product can be ultimately transferred to the rolling operation. So, if we compare this continuous casting with just we have studied about the ingot casting, then the following advantages emerge over ingot casting. That means, I am now listing the advantages of continuous casting over ingot casting. So, the advantages are first better quality, better quality of semi finished product semi finished product. Second, the semi finished product of a continuous casting plant consists of billet, bloom and slab. So, as such no slabbing mill or blooming mill or billet mill in, set, in fact is required as you are requiring when you have the ingot casting. So, the semi finished product from continuous casting plant can directly go into the rolling for finished product in contrast to ingot casting. Third advantage is higher crude to finished steel yield, higher crude steel to finished steel yield. Fourth, higher extent of automation is possible higher extent of automation is possible, it is better control can be exercised and quality of the product can be further improved. Fifth, as it is known that the product is semi finished, it has to be finished. In case of continuous casting, width of the slab, width of the slab. So, in continuous casting, width of the slab can be adjusted, can be adjusted with the downstream strip mill requirement for example, with respect to the width that is slab is used to produce a strip. At the end of the hot rolling of slab, there is a, these strips are coiled. So, depending on the width of the coiler, the width of the slab can be adjusted during continuous casting of steel. Another advantage is that ingots of larger sizes have increasing transverse and longitudinal segregation. In comparison to that, continuously cast product has lower segregation, has lower segregation. Another very important benefit for using continuous casting is hot 
direct charging of the semi finished product into the rolling mill is possible. In fact, it is being done because the semi finished product after continuous casting has a very high temperature of the order of 6 700 degrees Celsius and that one can adjust. So, that much of that much amount of energy you are going to save while reheating the billet for rolling purposes. So, the last advantage which is very important in terms of energy conservation issues that is hot direct charging hot direct charging is possible not only possible it is being done it is being practiced. Now, having said so much and so much advantages of continuous casting with this against ingot casting how continuous casting is done. In continuous casting the molten steel is poured from the ladle into the tun dish and from the tun dish into the oscillating copper mold which is cooled by the water. A partially solidified product is withdrawn constantly and continuously from the exit of the mold which is then subjected to water spray for complete solidification. That is how the continuous casting is done. Now, this entire process is attained by combining ladle, tundish, mold, water spray below the mold in such a way so that the speed of withdrawal of the partially solidified product from the mold is adjusted to the speed of pouring of liquid steel from ladle to tundish and tundish to mold. So, the figure shows the arrangement of different vessels in a continuous casting. So, this particular vessel is a refractory lined ladle refractory lined ladle which carry molten steel which carries molten. So, the red one that you are seeing this is in fact molten steel. Below the ladle a tundish is placed. So, this particular vessel is refractory lined tundish, refractory lined tundish and here is again we have the molten steel. This particular is a sort of a submerged nozzle for entry of liquid steel from ladle to tundish. So, this is this one is the submerged entry nozzle submerged entry nozzle. This one is in fact water cooled mold, water cooled mold and uh, these are the supporting rolls, this one, this one, they are the supporting rolls. to support the solidified shell. This one is a solidifying shell, solidifying shell. This 
solidifying shell and uh, somewhere here we have a torch cut off point where the slab of required length is cut and sent to the rolling mill. Now, below this water cool mold, we have this all arrangement which is shown over here. This is the water spray. This is the water spray. So, in fact, the combination of refractory line ladle, refractory line tundish, mold and secondary cooling, they all together they are placed in such a way so that the molten steel can be cast continuously. Now, in short I will define the functions of different vessel in short. For example, the role of tundish to maintain to maintain constant flow rate, to maintain constant flow rate of steel in the mold. That is one of the important function. Another important function it acts to act as a reservoir during ladle change, because when one ladle becomes empty then mold is to be supplied by, by molten steel, because it is a continuous process. At that point of time, the tundish supplies molten steel to the mold. Then another important vessel is the mold and whose, which is also called primary cooling zone, also called primary cooling zone. Its length or height, whichever you want to call is 0 0.7 to 0 0.8 meter and the cross section depends upon whether you want to cast billet, slab or bloom. Also mold is oscillating and the oscillating function it rather helps to strip the mold, so that a solidified shell along with the molten steel it, is, it can be withdrawn continuously from the mold. So, as you see in the figure that this particular, this particular red mark is the, the liquid steel, is the liquid steel that means the solidified shell in the core contains liquid steel and then it gets solidified. So, then you have the secondary cooling, we have secondary cooling which consists of water spray. They are arranged over the entire length of the strand. Then we also have a tertiary cooling, which is in fact due to radiation when the strand passes after the secondary cooling zone. Then the last we have torch cutoff point. And the objective of this thought is to cut the slab bloom or billet into the required length, so that it can be fed into the rolling mill. How the operation starts? Before filling up the mold, a dummy bar is inserted at the bottom of the mold. Remember, to start the operation, a dummy bar is inserted at the bottom of the mold. The liquid steel gets poured into the bottom into the mold, and this dummy bar is withdrawn along with the partially solidified strain from the mold, subjected to secondary cooling, and so on and so forth. Now some manifestations of this particular process I will be putting now as follows. For example, you have seen tundish as I have said 
refractory lined rectangular vessel. Now, the objective of putting down an intermediate vessel between ladle and the mold is to maintain to maintain constant steel flow rate into the mold, steel flow rate in the mold. That means, for major portion of the casting period, the molten steel bath height in the tun dish is kept constant except in the beginning and towards the end period when the ladle has emptied. Otherwise, in major period, the height of the steel bath in the crundish is kept constant. As I have said, mold is a copper mold, which has a very high thermal conductivity, because as the, as the molten steel is poured into the mold, the solidification start and it has to be very quick. So, it has to be of very high thermal conductivity, it is water cooled and this particular is called in the terminology of continuous casting, this is the primary cooling, this is the primary cooling. Length of the mold maximum it varies from 0.8 meter to 1.2 1 or 1.2 meter not more than that length of the mold is. Then below the mold as the product is withdrawn it is subjected with the intense water cooling. So, this is called then the water cooled water cooling below the mold this cooling is called secondary cooling. Secondary cooling and the objective of secondary cooling is to completely solidify the product, because at the exit of the mold the product is partially solidified, the complete solidification occurs in the secondary cooling zone. Now, secondary cooling zone length is of the order of 8 to 10 times that of primary cooling zone. Then after the secondary cooling, we may have the tertiary cooling and this tertiary cooling is occurs by way of radiation. So, location of complete solidification in the secondary cooling zone is very important because after that there is no sort of intense cooling, it just cools in the atmosphere. And then we have a cutter which finally cast or which finally cuts the product into the required length which can be tolerated in the rolling mill. Now, just to give you an idea, a ladle which is having for example, 150 tons of steel with the help of continuous casting and at the speed of 3 tons per minute, a 150 ton ladle can be cast into a product just in 50 minutes. So, the process is really very, very fast and hence the control at each stage right from pouring of liquid steel from ladle to tundish, from tundish to mold, the partially solidified withdrawn strand, strand and the secondary cooling all are very, very important thing. Now, these machines, I mean the arrangement of these three, it can be of few types. One of the type for example, is a vertical bending, is a vertical bending. In the initial development of the continuous casting process, the entire process was vertical, ladle from ladle to tundish, tundish to mold, then withdrawal of the strand was also vertical, where hence the length 
of the plant or height of the plant was very very high. Now then came the vertical bending that means the partially solidified product from the mold goes to the secondary cooling and from there it is bent. So, the in the vertical bending product or semi, semi finished product is cast straight then it is curved with the liquid core is still present. So, that is an important that means the solid shell which is formed must have sufficient strain so that the bending can be allowed. Now, the whole idea of bending is to decrease the height. Now, another important development to decrease the height is that of curved molds, is that of curved molds. Now, here the slabs they are generally cast in curved molds are generally cast in curved molds. Now, here in the curved molds the strand leaves the mold at an arched section. At that time it is necessary that a strong shell has already been formed because the mold is slightly in the curved fashion. Straightening is done progressively by passing through circular arcs with increasing radii. So, what is important in case of curved mold continuous casting is that the, the product or the strand which leaves the mold it is also curved in nature and gradually it is, uh, it is being withdrawn and subjected to secondary cooling. Now, say some continuous casting nomenclature some continuous casting nomenclature say molten steel exiting from ladle that is normally called ladle stream normally called ladle stream. Then molten steel exiting from tundish, from tundish is called tundish stream, is called tundish stream. Now, also you will hear or you must have heard while I was delivering a lecture about the strand. Strand is in fact, the name given to semi finished product and these names, these strand means it is a billet or bloom or slab. In fact, strand means they are the solidified product. So, you can have a slab casting machine or a bloom casting machine or a billet casting machine. Number of strand, say number of strand that means number of molds, number of molds placed below the tundish, below the tundish. Say we have a single strand continuous casting machine where one mold is kept, or we have a multi strand casting machine, as you must have heard the names, or you will be reading in the books. There, more than one is, uh, molds are kept below the tundish. For example, say also we can say number of tundish streams number of tundish streams that is equal to 
number of moles number of moles say if you say one ton dish stream say it's a single strain continuous casting machine two strain two ton dish stream we say it is a twin strain casting machine if four six or eight then we say four six or eight strain continuous casting machine now these four six and eight strain are normally used to cast molten steel in the form of bloom or billet twin strain casting machine is used for slab a slab the dimensions or the cross section of the slab is 1500 to 2800 mm width into 150 to 270 mm thickness billet is a square section 100 into 100 or 150 into 150 and bloom is a slightly rectangular in cross section now for single strand tundish stream is obtained through tundish nozzles which are placed at the bottom of the tundish and the flow rate is controlled by slide gate or by valves now here the location of tundish stream location of ladle stream is important in fact the ladle stream is submerged into the tundish so the location of ladle stream with reference to tundish nozzle is important for single strand now by now you are familiar for single strand for single strand molten steel enters from one end of the tundish and exits from the other end of the tundish for multi strand for multi strand if l is the length of the tundish w is width of the tundish and h is the bath height of the tundish then center of the tundish then center of tundish is located at l by 2 and w by 2 at l by 2 and w by 2 z is equal to 0 in multi strain tundish in multi strain tundish ladle stream is located in the tundish at l by 2 w by 2 and 0.7 to point 9 h location that means the stream is submerged into the bath and also the tundish nozzles are symmetrical on both sides of ladle stream that means if i have a two strain casting machine then one nozzle is on the left side of the stream and another nozzle is on the right side of the stream at equal distance from the ladle stream sometimes for six or eight strands say sometimes for six or eight strands machine the ladle stream in the tundish is asymmetrical to the tundish nozzle and this asymmetricity can be defined as or the ladle stream can be located at l by 2 0.75 w and at 0.72.9 h now in multi strain casting for six or eight strain casting machine the location of ladle stream is very important because if you look from the top of the tundish then it looks something this way if i show 
top of the turn ridge this is the center line and this is where here the ladle stream is hitting with just at the center and one turn ridge nozzle is here another is here one is here and one is here it is a four strand continuous casting machine then you can imagine that the molten steel which is entering into the nearby turn dish and molten steel is, uh, stream that is entering in the farthermost turn dish they may have a dissimilar temperature as well as composition and accordingly the strain which is coming out from all the four uh, molds will be dissimilar so in order to avoid dissimilarity of the strain it is essential that the temperature and chemical composition of molten steel entering into the nearest nozzle and the farthest nozzle they are approximately same so in that if i put 2 1 2 3 and 4 so i'll call 2 and 3 are nearer to ladle stream or nearer to ladle stream whereas 1 and 4 are farther to ladle stream all the four strains are placed below 1 2 3 and 4 so if there is a variation in temperature and chemical composition then the strain will be dissimilar and hence that precaution is to be taken the ladle stream is arranged such that this thing does not happen now with this another important issue is now how the heat flow in continuous casting occurs now you know you can simply think that mold is the heart of continuous casting the mold provides first solidification it is the mold where solidification begins and on account of solidification a partially solidified with partially solidified strand now i can use the word strand is withdrawn what are the requirement the strength of the solid shell which is formed in the mold should be very strong otherwise there will be break out will occur the solid shell the solid shell which forms in the primary cooling zone or in the mold is of very thin so the heat flow in continuous casting heat flow in continuous casting heat flow in continuous casting is important i have shown here the uh, heat flow which is occurring during continuous casting of steel that is when the steel is poured from turn dish to mold it is from there the solidification begins so you see here this is the liquid stream which is entering this is the mold this one this unit which is shown by the black is the mold in here it's a water cool mold so during cooling a partially solidified strain is formed and this this red portion is shown the partially solidified strain in the center of the mold still there is a liquid steel is there that is this partially solidified strain is holding liquid steel that means this partially solidified strain must have a very high strain near to the liquid steel there is a mushy zone that is being shown and uh, this mushy zone it extends also in the secondary cooling zone so first of all the major requirements major requirements for 
heat flow first of all solidification must complete solidification must complete before the strain enters into the withdrawal role that means the solidification it begins from here and it ends over here so these these are the say uh, withdrawal roles that means the entire strain must be solidified before it enters into the withdrawal role second important thing is that liquid steel core liquid steel core must be bowl shaped with that what i mean say so this is the liquid steel shell and this this shape is a sort of a bowl steel shaped and this shape is necessary for solidification third important requirement is metal shell in the mold the metal shell which is produced in the mold should have sufficient strength should have sufficient strength if not then what will happen the breakout will occur so therefore the casting speed must be matched with the rate of pouring of liquid steel from tundish to mold such that the solidification occurs completely before the strain enters into the withdrawal role now what is the casting speed the casting speed is the rate of linear movement of the strand and it is given in terms of meter per minute so higher casting speed higher casting speed which one may be tempted to increase the productivity what it leads to you will be having less time available for heat extraction in mold for heat extraction in mold because extraction of heat in the mold is the primary important that forms the solid shell which has to be withdrawn so the primary cooling that is in the mold is of very important so less time available for heat extraction in the mold so what will happen lesser thickness lesser thickness of the solidified shell of the solidified shell will be there at the mold exit at the mold exit as a result what will happen longer length of the liquid core longer length of the liquid core and what will be longer again that of mashi zone therefore the casting speed must be optimized now what is important here from consideration of the heat transfer in continuous casting what has emerged as a most important issue is that of adjusting the heat transfer condition i repeat once again unless or the primary cooling in the mold does not form a metal shell of sufficient thickness it will create problems 
during the further heat extraction uh, mechanisms. So, the most important thing is the casting is the mold part. Now, the further things we will discuss in the next lecture.